Welcome to the first video of AQA GCSE Chemistry Topic 1, Atomic Structure and the Periodic Table. The first section of this topic involves atoms, elements and compounds. All substances are made of atoms. An atom is the smallest unit of matter that can undergo chemical change. Atoms of each element are represented by a chemical symbol. For example, oxygen is represented by the letter O and sodium is represented by the symbol Na because it is named after the Latin name natron and therefore Na. <coughs> There are approximately a hundred different elements and they are all to be found in your periodic table of elements. Compounds are formed from elements by a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions involve the formation of one or more than one substance and often involve a de detectable change in energy. For example, the reaction of magnesium and oxygen, both elements to form magnesium oxide, a compound, releases lots of heat and light. The definition of a compound is something that contains two or more elements chemically combined in fixed proportions and can be re represented by a formula using the symbols of the atoms from which they are formed. For example, Mg representing magnesium and oxygen representing O, in the fixed proportion one to one. Compounds can only be separated by chemical reactions because they have been formed by a chemical reaction. You can represent chemical reactions using word equations, for example, hydrogen plus oxygen makes water, or for higher test students, balanced chemical equations using symbols and formulae. Now, quick check. You should be able to use the names and symbols of the first 20 elements in the periodic table, including the elements in groups 1 and 7, and some other elements defined by the specification. You should be able to name compounds of these elements from a given formula or symbol equations, and write word or balanced chemical equations for their reactions. Now we're going to move on and talk about mixtures. A mixture consists of two or more elements or compounds that are not chemically combined together. The chemical properties of each substance in the mixture are unchanged. For example, iron is magnetic, sulphur is not. A mixture of iron and sulphur will show that the iron remains magnetic and the sulphur is not. <coughs> Mixtures can be separated using physical processes because they have not been joined together by chemical means. You need to know about the following processes. First one, filtration. Filtration is where a solution separating a soluble substance in a solution and an insoluble substance. These can be separated by decanting the mixture into a filter funnel and filter paper where the insoluble solid is separated and remains inside the filter paper as a residue whereas the solution is able to pass through the filter paper and is collected at the bottom as a filtrate. These processes do not involve a chemical reaction. The second process is crystallisation where we have a salt solution and we are able to um, remove the water by firstly heating until the solution reduces by half and then lead to evaporate so that the crystals gradually form. If we do not leave it to evaporate we will just produce the anhydrous salt. So for example when we've made copper sulphate um, you get blue rhombic blue crystals may contain some water and if you if you boil to dryness, you will get a white powder, the anhydrous uh, salt. The next process is simple distillation, for example, separating salt and water. And we're separating the mixture by the property of boiling point. Um, water will boil at 100 degrees, salt will boil um, 
at thousands of degrees so the water boils first, rises up the distillation flask into the condenser where it cools, condenses and then um, forms the distillate at pure water. At the end of the experiment salt will remain in the distillation flask and the pure water will be in the distillate flask. Fractional distillation is the, is the same process but separating a complex mixture. So, i.e., fractional distillation would be used to separate crude oil, which is made of thousands of different components. So, this is where crude oil enters at approximately 400 degrees, where the majority of the mixture have become a gas vapor. It enters the column where at the bottom it's 350 degrees, and as you rise up the column, it becomes cooler. So at the so at the top it's 250 degrees, uh, 25 degrees, sorry. And as the as the uh, different alkanes enter the condenser, as they rise and they reach their boiling point, they will condense. For example, kerosene will rise until it reaches its boiling point and then it will condense and it will be separated off in trays. Large molecules have high boiling points and are collected at toward the bottom of the column where shorter alkanes have lower boiling points and are collected at the top. A lesser refinery gas and they remain as a gas throughout the whole process. Now our last substance is chromatography. Chromatography is a process where we, and I'm sure you've done it many times, we use a beaker of water and we place inside a uh, filter paper and we mark a pencil line and then we place a spot of pigment or dye and then we allow the water to run up the paper and it carries the pigment with it because it's soluble in water and then we stop the experiment when the water reaches the top and at the end we can have a look at the chromatogram produced. The chromatogram below we can see that we had a mixture and it's separated into three spots and we can see that the mixture contained three substances. And then we can actually compare these to references and we can see that these colours are the same as our references because they have travelled the same distance or have the same RA. Okay, so by now you should be able to describe and explain and give examples of specified processes of separation. For example, filtration, um, chromatography, uh, simple distillation, uh, fractional distillation. And you should be able to um, suggest suitable separation and purification, purification techniques. Okay, moving on, you need to know about the development of the atom. New experimental evidence has led to scientific model being changed or replaced over time. Before the first discovery of the electron, atoms were thought to be spheres that could not be divided, and hence their name, atomos, which means indivisible in Greek. This explained the idea of atoms, but didn't explain why things um, could conduct electricity. Then we end into uh, a new period with the discovery of the electron. J.J. Thompson um, theorised that atoms were like plum puddings, that is, that the plums inside the pudding were the electrons, the newly discovered electrons, and the pudding, the rest of the material, was the positive charge. And he theorised that the electrons were randomly distributed within the atom, um, like plums in a pudding, and he didn't know about a nucleus. He, re he thought that all of the rest of it was the positive charge. So he didn't explain Alpha Rutherford's alpha scattering um, or, uh, um, experiment, but we did be able, we were able to talk about uh, positive and negative charge in an atom. Following uh, Rutherford's um, alpha scattering experiment, he led to the conclusion that as alpha particles pass through the gold foil, the uh, majority of the atom is actually empty space. Um, however, some were deflected back. And we knew that alpha particles had a positive charge, so that the centre of the atom 
must be a center of positive charge and we call that the nucleus. So this is what we call the nuclear model. An atom has electrons orbiting on the outside but has a nucleus in the center. So we've, we've come up with the idea we've got a nucleus but we do not know why electrons um, have specific energy in line spectra. And then the next adaptation of the model was Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr suggested electrons orbit in the specific orbitals or energy levels, that is that they are in this region but not between these energy levels and these are specific for different elements. Um, and then the last piece of the puzzle was the idea that the positive charge of the nucleus could be broken into two particles that are protons and neutrons in the Chadwick actually provided evidence for the discovery of neutrons. Okay, quick check. You need to be able to describe why new evidence from the alpha scattering experiment led to a change in the atomic model. That is, that the plum pudding model, where the positive charge was like a sponge which was all over the entire atom, was actually refined to be in the nucleus, which was in a tiny space at the centre of the atom. You also need to um, be able to talk about the differences in between the plum pudding where the electrons are randomly scattered and also in the Bohr model where they are orbiting in discrete energy shells. Okay, moving on. You need to know the relative electric charges of subatomic particles. In an atom, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. That is because protons have a positive one charge and electrons have a negative one charge and the atoms have no overall charge. So they must have an equal number of protons and electrons to have no overall charge. The number of protons also tells us what atom it is. So for example, all atoms of carbon contain six protons. It defines it as being carbon. If an atom was to have seven protons, then that would make it a different element that would make it nitrogen. You also need to be able to know the relative masses of subatomic particles. Atoms are really, really, really small. They're approximately 0.1 nanometers, that is 1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Or if I had a meter stick, I could line up 10 billion atoms end on end. The radius of the nucleus is much smaller, occupying only 1 ten thousandths of the size of the atom. That's hard to imagine. So another analogy would be um, if I had uh, the atom being the size of Wembley Stadium, the nucleus would be the size of a marble on the centre line. So nearly all of the atom is actually empty space. However, nearly all of the mass of the atom is within the nucleus. So atoms are incredibly dense. The relative masses of the subatomic particles are as follows. Protons have a mass of one relative to neutrons. Neutrons have a mass of one relative to protons and electrons. And electrons do have a mass, but it's incredibly small, approximately 1 divided by 1,860. Now, the sum of the protons and neutrons in an atom is called its mass number. And this is an average accounting for the isotopes. So atoms have the same of the same element have a different number of neutrons. Remember, all atoms of the same element have the same number of protons, so the only reason why they could have a different mass is because they have a different number of neutrons. These are called isotopes. Now the relative atomic mass of an element is an average, and that takes into account all the abundances, that is how much of each isotope there are you need to be able to calculate the relative atomic mass of an element given its percentages. For example, if you were told that an, a sample of boron contains 20% boron 10 and 80% boron 11, what would be its relative atomic mass? Well, the first thing we do is we know it's an average, so we have to add all of the masses together. So that's 
20 times boron's that have a mass of 10 plus 80 times all the boron 11 atoms and then divide it by the number of atoms that we have and because we have percentages the total number of values we've added together is 100 and therefore the relative atomic mass would be 10.8. You also need to know about the electronic structure of atoms and know that electrons in an atom occupy energy levels or energy shells and they are always fill the energy shells closest to the nucleus because the nucleus is attracting the electrons and you need to know that we can fit a maximum of two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, eight in the third shell and two in the fourth because you only need to go up to atomic number of 20 calcium. For example, the electronic structure of sodium can be drawn as 2.8.1 or we can write it as 2.8.1. You need to be able to do that for the first 20 elements. Okay, quick check. You should be able to use the nuclear model to describe atoms. You should be able to calculate the relative numbers of protons, neutrons and electrons in an atom or an ion, given its atomic number and mass. You should be able to relate the size and scale of atoms to objects in the physical world, and you should be able to calculate the relative atomic mass of an element given the percentage abundance of its isotopes. <clears throat> and lastly, we're going to look at the periodic table. Elements in the periodic table are arranged in order of a proton number, starting at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to 120. It's arranged so that elements in similar properties are in columns called groups. We have group 1, group 2, group 3, group 4, group 5 and so on. You should also know that the rows are called periods. Period 3, period 4, period 5 and so on. And they also have a regular repeating pattern of their properties. Now elements in the same group have the same electronic configuration so every element in group 1 has one electron in their outermost shell and that gives them similar, similar properties. For example they all form positive 1 ions. Similarly in group 2 they all have positive 2 so they all form positive 2 ions. You've probably learned that group 7 has seven electrons in their outermost shell, so they will form ions of negative one. Likewise, if they're all in, if you have elements in the same period, they have the same number of occupied shells. So period one, hydrogen, helium have one occupied shell. Period two have two occupied shells. Okay. Now to development of the periodic table. <coughs> Before the discovery of protons, neutrons and electrons, scientists tried to organise elements by arranging them in order of atomic weight. 1, 5, 5 point something, 7, 9, 13 and so on. The earliest tables were incomplete as some elements were placed in inappropriate groups and some elements had not been discovered yet. Dmitry Mendeleev is accredited for designing the modern periodic table. And his genius was to put things in order of increasing atomic mass. 1, 7, 9, 11, 12, 14, 16, 19 and so on. But also put them into groups based on their chemical properties. So here we have lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, all in group 1. Because they all react in a similar way and form oxides of a similar uh, formula. However, unlike other scientists, he also realised that not all the elements had been discovered. And rather than put things in the next group just to fill the space, he actually left gaps so that elements could be in a group with similar characteristics and chemical properties. He was able, therefore, to actually make predictions about elements that had not been discovered yet. And and these proved to be very accurate. And when they were discovered years later, um, this gave a lot of weight to Dmitry Mendeleev's use of the periodic table. Metals and non-metals. 
elements in groups one, two, and three have one, two, three electrons in their outermost shell respectively. Now, to obtain a noble gas structure, that is a full outer shell, they either lose one in the case of sodium, two or three electrons. This gives them a positive charge. We call these elements metals. Elements that have seven, six, five or even four, it is easier for them to gain electrons and therefore they, be, they become negative ions and we call them non-metals. The majority of elements in the periodic table are metals. Metals can be found to the left and if we look over here, we can see that there is a stairwell or stair shape that, that starts with aluminium and then works its way down. So if you want to identify a metal, a good tip to draw the stairwell on the periodic table before the during the exam and then realise that anything to the left or under the stairs is a metal. Group naught. Group naught are called the noble gases. They are unreactive because they don't need to share electrons uh, because they have a full outer shell. For example, helium has two electrons, there's a maximum of two in the first shell, neon eight, argon eight. So therefore they don't need to share or take or lose any electrons, they don't need to react with anything. You also need to know the boiling points, and as you go down the group, the boiling point increases. However, you'll see that they are all gases at room temperature because if you look down at the scale here, even radon is a gas at minus 55. Group 1. Group 1 elements are known as group 1 because, as we said, they have one electron in their outermost shell and that gives them their characteristic properties because of the single electron. As you go down the group, the alkaline metals become more reactive. That is because they have a weaker attraction to their outermost electron. This is because as you go down the group, there are more shells in the way. So lithium has only one shell between the nucleus and the outermost electron. Where sodium has two, potassium has three, rubidium four, cesium five, francium six. Also, as the atom gets larger, the atomic radius increases, the nucleus is further away from the outermost electron. And these two factors mean that the nuclear attraction to the outermost electron is weaker and therefore it can lose its electron more easily. You should be able to describe the reactions of free alkali metals with oxygen, chlorine and water. Now I've used lithium, sodium and potassium here, but because they behave in a similar way, you could just as easily swap sodium here and the symbol Na and it would react in the same way. So lithium and oxygen makes lithium oxide, sodium and chlorine makes sodium chloride, and potassium water makes potassium hydroxide and hydrogen. Notice here how we have the ending ide, and ide means that it is a um, mono, meaning one atomic anion. So this makes an ion of minus two charge. This would make an ion of minus one charge. Now on to group seven. Elements in group seven of the periodic table are called the halogens. This is Greek for salt former. Because they all have, uh, because they're in group seven, they all have seven electrons in their outermost shell. <coughs> Halogens are non-metals, as we talked about, because they don't form positive ions. And, well, when on their own, uh, are diatomic. That is, they have seven electrons in their outermost shell, and to fill their outermost shell, they share one electron each, they share one pair, and therefore they form a diatomic F2. You also need to know about their melting point and boiling point trends. As you go down the group, as you can see, the melting point increases, as does their boiling point. So at room temperature, fluorine, chlorine are a gas. Bromine is a liquid. Iodine and the statin are solids. And the trend is, as they become heavier, their relative atomic mass increases, or relative molecular mass, sorry, increases, F2, CO2, Br2, I2, A2. So does their melting point and boiling point. 
The reactivity is the opposite to group one. As you go up the group, they become more reactive because remember they're in group seven, so instead of losing electron, they're trying to attract an electron. And therefore, it, it, the fluorine is the most attractive because it has the least shielding and it's the smallest atomic radius and therefore has a greater nuclear attraction. A more reactive halogen can displace a less reactive halogen in aqueous solution. <coughs> you should be able to describe how these how halogens react with metals and non-metals. For example, metal plus halogen makes metal halide, sodium plus chlorine, so it makes sodium chloride. Now, the ending ene here means that it is the diatonic form of the halogens. For example, chlorine is Cl2. And remember, the ending ide means that it is the mono one atomic anion. So this is a Cl minus ion. They can also react with non-metals such as hydrogen, and they make a hydrogen halide. For example, hydrogen plus chlorine, Cl2, would form hydrogen chloride, HCl. Transition metals. Transition metals are metals with similar properties which are different from those of group 1. Transition metals can be found between group 2 and 3 of your periodic table. And those are what we call more typical metals. So ones that are more familiar with iron, um, silver, gold, platinum, copper. The transition metals have many different ions. So unlike group 1 where they only form positive 1 ions, for example, copper can form plus one or plus two, or iron can form plus two or plus three. So that makes them uh, useful as catalysts, and it also means that they can form many different coloured complexes. Now, a quick checkpoint. You should be able to explain how the position of an element in the periodic table is related to the arrangement of electrons in its atom, and then hence its atomic number. That is, that... All elements in group 1 have one electron in its outermost shell, and therefore we can actually explain their chemical properties. You should be able to predict possible reactions and the possible reactivity of elements from their positions in the periodic table. So we've looked at as you go down group 1, they become more reactive, or if you go up group 7, they become more reactive. You should also be able to describe these steps in the development of the periodic table. So that's talking about how we went from um, early periodic tables which put things in order of atomic mass to Mendeleev's where who put things into groups and left gaps and made predictions about undiscovered elements. You should also be able to explain the differences between non-metals and metals on the basis of their physical and chemical properties. So that metals are shiny, they are able to conduct electricity, they are um, good conductors of heat, they are uh, malleable, they are ductile, whereas non-metals are not generally. And you should be able to explain how the reaction of elements relate to the arrangement of electrons in their atomic and hence their atomic number.